Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. This week we talk with Jacob Hornberger, who is a candidate for president under the Libertarian Party. We're going to talk about the values of individualism. We're going to talk about the proper roles of government and more importantly, how the improper roles of government, the things that government gets involved that it shouldn't hurt people. Check it out. cell phone oh, let me ringer sure. off let me make sure of that before you i was watching going. one of your video casts and your phone went off which happens to me once in a while yeah and it actually wasn't the phone because <laughs> i had the phone muted it was a friggin' alarm and so i was so surprised when it went off and i'd, I'd set an alarm to remind myself so i don't have any alarms set i don't think do you have like one political phone and one how many is that why you have two yeah yeah <laughs> Maybe we could just spend a whole hour railing about um, the regulation of political speech. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so you, uh, you, you ventured straight into the belly of the beast. We're only a couple of blocks from the Capitol. Does that give you anxiety in any way? Oh, horrible anxiety. It's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm right here in the center of the empire. That I'm surrounded. Do you think, it, like, if you spend more than a day here, would you actually turn into sort of a, a zombie that just gobbles up other people's wealth? No, I don't think so. I'd like to think that I would be spreading light among, amidst all the darkness and extinguishing the darkness. Well, we're, we're trying, and I may, I may be a, immune to the zombie virus because I've been inside the Beltway a long time, and, and I would argue at least that I haven't become one of them, but maybe we'll debate that and you can see. But uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a couple things in particular. You're running for president on the Libertarian ticket, uh, you are the longtime um, founder and longtime leader of, of the Future of Freedom Foundation. And you are what I would consider sort of a pure libertarian. Like you're, you're one of those philosophical guys that, that doesn't like to compromise the core principles. So I thought we'd talk, start first with a little bit of your background and, and uh, you know, what was your, what was your gateway to libertarianism because because clearly you were having a productive life before that and now you're drawn into this community. Yeah, well, first let me say it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you, Matt. We, we love your stuff at the Future of Freedom Foundation, uh, which I should emphasize is not endorsing my campaign in any way. It's a 501c3. But there's three particular videos that we have shared with our readers and viewers. Um, there, the one on Ayn Rand that you did, the one on Rush, and the one on the Grateful Dead, because my colleague Bart, he's a deadhead. Nice, <laughs> so, nice. So we love your stuff, and, and so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I grew up uh, on the border in Laredo, Texas. Uh, I grew up on a farm on the Rio Grande, and I was a Democrat. My father was involved in Democratic Party politics, and he was a lawyer. And ever since I was old enough to think, I was going to be a lawyer. I mean, that, that was my dream in life. When school teachers would ask to write essays on what you wanted to be when you grew up, I was going to be a lawyer. And so that's what I ended up doing. I got a law degree, and I, I went back to Laredo in partnership with my dad to practice law. And I loved it. I mean, I was studying books on cross-examination, direct examination, um, jury summation, and so forth. But then... One day, I walked into the public library of all places in Laredo and looking for something to read. I was kind of disillusioned with politics, uh, you know, Democratic Party politics. And back at that time, everybody was a Democrat in Texas. So I, I go to the political science section of the public library, and I see these four little different colored books. And so I pulled them off the shelf and started perusing them. And I was just bowled over. I mean, this was a true road to Damascus experience. I, I was just so shocked at what I was reading. And what they were was essay books that had been published by the Foundation for Economic Education back in the 50s, which was 20 years before I discovered them. And I checked out all four books and took them home, and it just changed the course of my life. I, all the scales started dropping from my eyes about what was going on in America and the problems that America was having, and everything started to make sense. And so I later discovered that Fee was still in existence, and I went up to their conferences and their summer seminar, and uh, that caused me to shift the course of my life. I ended up 
moving to Dallas after my father passed away to open up my own law practice there. But my heart was with libertarianism. I was doing hobbies, um, organizing, speaking, uh, visiting speakers coming in. I organized in Dallas, the Mont Dallas Society, which had people that I know that you know, Richard Ebeling and Peter Lowen and Gary Short and Jeannie Short. And yeah. we would get together to discuss libertarianism and Austrian economics. And finally, I got offered a job at, at Fee. And uh, so I had this this choice to make. At the same time, a major out-of-town law firm was contacting me to talk about being their managing partner in an office that they were opening in Dallas. So that was the big choice that I had to make in my life at that point. I went off to fee, and two years later, I decided to go out and start FFF, and here that's where I am now. So I, I actually met you for the first time. I, I think I was a graduate student around 1987, 88, something like that, and that's when you were at fee. And uh, uh, my professor at Grove City College, Hans Sentholtz, had been intimately involved with fee, I think, for, for forever, probably, back to the beginning. But that was, uh, for me, that was a moment when I realized that, that I wasn't the only libertarian in the world because, <laughs> because I was reading Ayn Rand, and Ayn Rand says to read Mises, and, and she completely screwed up my high school years. <laughs> I tell this joke all the time, but it is it is an empirical fact that that high school girls do not like boys that want to talk about uh, Austrian economics. <laughs> Shockingly, <laughs> but I learned out the hard way. But uh, so we met at we met at Fee when you were like director of programs, something like that. And uh, w- did you meet Leonard Reed? Yeah, uh, on the. The founder of Fee. Yeah, he was the founder of Fee, and I later wrote an essay that got published in the Freeman, which is the monthly journal of of Fee, entitled Leonard Reed Changed My Life, because Reed really was the the catalyst for my transformation to libertarianism. Uh, His writings were always so clear and succinct. I always felt like he was writing directly to me. And so when I went up to, to Fee for the weekend seminar, I met him. And then when I went for the summer seminar and met him, um, and that was a week-long seminar in the summer, and it was just so amazing to meet the man who was changing the course of my life. Uh, And and I remember, you know, I didn't know enough about libertarianism where I could engage in him on any intelligent basis, but, but as a lawyer, I had a question ready for him, and I was ready to debate either side of the question. And I, so I'm sitting across from him at lunch one time, just him and me at a little table there in the um, dining room. And I said, Mr. Reed, if people in a society unanimously vote to establish a socialist system, should they be free to do that? <laughs> and I was ready to go on either side. <laughs> he, he thinks and he thinks and he thinks and he gave me the worst possible answer. <laughs> Can you guess what his answer was? Uh, yes. No. His answer was, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, how do you argue with well, that? I don't that's, know. That's, that's probably the honest answer because it, <laughs> you would have to start digging a little bit deeper to, to find out. Because I, you know, my answer would be is, as long as there's free entry and exit, um, I'm all for some socialist commune going off somewhere and, and living lives as they as they see fit but i don't i don't know if that's socialism because i always technically socialism is the government um controlling everything from the top down and it's not in, like this is what marx would say it's socialism is a dictatorship of the proletariat so it depends on your terms i suppose it does because you're right a commune a voluntary commune is one thing but when all of a sudden you have a governmental apparatus that's enforcing on everyone. There's no exit there. Yeah, there's no exit there. Yeah. <laughs> and you got children to think about too. Right. They didn't agree to this. Yes. Uh, but those are those were kind of the fun things and and what what I loved about Leonard Reed, I never got to meet him, but but you're able to go back now and, and watch his lectures and, and certainly read his stuff. He thought that the purpose of the Foundation for Economic Education was one, to stand on principle, but two, to you know, is almost a missionary thing where we wanted to um, not necessarily recruit people to liberty, but to, to give them a compelling story that, that would turn them on to these ideas so that they could choose to sort of follow that path as well. 
Is, do you think that's accurate? Absolutely. And, and one of the things that really I remember so clearly is his concluding lecture where he had all the lights in the room extinguished. And then he had this light bulb and a little rheostat. And he would so slowly start lighting the light bulb. And, he, and he, he said that the darkness is the world in which we're living with respect to freedom. And this light bulb is you, is the libertarian. That's, that's The more you self-improve, because he was a big advocate of self-improvement, the more you learn about libertarianism and study it and master it, the more you're lighting up the world. And so that's where you should spend your time because the better you get, then people will come to you and start seeking answers. And then through this multiplicity of light bulbs all across the world, the darkness is extinguished. And, and that just had a powerful impact on me. Yeah. So give us, uh, for, for people on watching this show that are sort of liberty curious and they've, they've heard this word libertarian if they're watching this show, uh, what is what is the philosophy of libertarianism? You, I'm, I'm trapped on an elevator with you. I can't get away. <laughs> what, what's the pitch? Libertarianism entails the right to do whatever you want in your life so long as your conduct is peaceful and non-fraudulent. So you should be free to engage in any peaceful conduct that, that is conduct that does not involve the initiation of force or fraud against another person. So that necessarily means that people ought to be discussing and debating. And this, if I were accorded the honor of the presidential nomination of the Libertarian Party, this would be my aim, is to have every American discussing and debating two questions. What does it really mean to be free? And two, what is the legitimate role of government in a free society? So libertarians say that freedom is, I define, is the right to do whatever you want as long as your conduct is peaceful, and that the role of government is to protect the exercise of the way people are choosing and limit itself to going after the violent people, the murderers, the rapists, the thieves, and so forth, uh, establishing a judicial system where people can resolve disputes peacefully, and protecting the nation against an invasion as compared to all this foreign interventionism that takes place. Well, people might generally say, Jacob, that sounds pretty good. I can't argue with that overall philosophy. Well, the, the rub comes in on the specific applications so, because we would get rid of all mandatory charity programs because mandatory charity is not charity in our books. It's also not freedom, that you have a right to keep everything you earn and you decide what to do with it. So we get rid of Social Security. We don't try to reform it. Medicare, get rid of it. Get rid of every mandatory socialist program. Uh, the, the drug war. The entire social safety net is no not, safety net not an appropriate role for government. Exactly. And and it's also because freedom works. It's not just a morally sound philosophy, but you can trust people to exercise freedom in such a way that most children and grandchildren will step up to the plate and help their parents and grandparents in times of need. If they don't, the church groups will, the, the, the voluntary groups, foundations, and so forth. We've got to recapture that, that faith and freedom in ourselves and others that once uh, characterized this nation. Uh, the drug war. We, we would get rid of all dr drug laws, on, on all drugs, uh, no matter how harmful, opioids, cocaine, heroin, and so forth, because you have a right to ingest whatever you want to ingest, no matter how bad it is, without being punished by the state for it. Uh, and also because it's practical. Drug legalization is the only thing that's going to restore a sense of peace and harmony to our society as compared to the drug war. Uh, open borders, uh, the free movements of goods and people across borders, because, again, this is peaceful conduct. It's the exercise of the pursuit of happiness, one of the natural God-given rights that Jefferson talks about in the Declaration, and it works. It's the only way to get rid of this perpetual immigration crisis that has brought death, suffering, in a police state. Dismantle the entire national security state. The Pentagon, the CIA, the military-industrial complex, the, the NSA, restore a limited government republic to our land. Bring all the troops home from everywhere uh, and discharge them. They're not necessary. So now that's the rub. That's where, where people can understand the overall philosophy. They might say, oh, wait a minute, I can't go with you that far, Jacob. Well, the, you know, the challenge on, on all of that stuff, and I, I'll probably want to go through some of that and 
and and dig a little bit deeper. But the the challenge for people living in the United States today is that they they were born and grew up in a world where that was how we did things. And and if if we are going to have a social safety net, it's it's uh, private charity has been very much atrophied in that sense of of charitable. And I would use the word responsibility. That you know if 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 you're if someone in your community is in trouble, there was a time when churches and neighbors um, felt a responsibility to step up and, and fix that problem. Now they're like, I give half my money to the government. They're, they said they would take care of it. I've, I've given enough. And so it almost makes people cynical and resentful of, of that. Um, explain how it is that free people are charitable. How do how do they solve these problems? Because because right now the government's doing it, and and for all of the downsides of that, um, at least it's being done. Yeah, but it's done through coercion. It's a system that that forces people to be good and caring, and I I would argue that force and good and caring are opposites. Uh, that in other words, if I accost you at an ATM machine while you're getting some money out, and I force you at the point of a gun to give me $10,000 and you give me that money and I take that money and I go and give it to a homeless person or to a person that needs a life-saving operation. Can I be said to be a good and caring person because I've done this? I, I think we'd all agree. Of course not, Jacob. I mean, if, if you want to help that person, you do it with your own money or you go out and ask people to help him with money, but you don't rob a person of his money. But in essence, that's what we're having government doing with this social safety net or Medicare or any of these social welfare programs, that the government's doing the dirty deed. Taxation is force. So the IRS goes and takes money from people and gives it to others. Who's the good and caring person in this process? The taxpayer? Uh, the IRS agent? Uh, the politicians who enact these programs? I would say none of them. That, that charity has to come from the voluntary heart of the individual. So freedom necessarily requires a way of life where each person keeps everything he earns, and he makes that decision. It's like going through the grocery store line when the cashier says, do you want to donate a dollar to such and such charity? You have a right to say yes or no. That's the way it should be across the board. And so in a free society, you, you have trust. And you know, I'm a Christian, so I look at it, God trusted people with free will. Uh, and what the state does, the state comes along and says, well, God made a mistake. He should never have trusted people. We need to force people because you can't count on them to do the right thing. Well, I say freedom entails that opportunity to do the right thing. You can't take that away from people. And you can trust people to do the right thing. I like to say that that, that take it a step further, and, and I, I get this from Ayn Rand, and she would probably um, argue with me if she was alive today, but I, I, I view freedom, individual freedom, as, as a very important form of responsibility. Um, how I conduct my own life, whether or not that I, that I live the values I, I espouse, but also on a very practical problem-solving level. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends, has a very interesting configuration of, of, of a libertarian view of personal safety because he says that it is not the best way to protect yourself. How do you, how do you protect yourself and your family? And if you ask that to most libertarians, they're probably going to say, get some guns. That's what the Second Amendment's for. And his point is that that's not true. The best way to keep your family safe is to live in a neighborhood where other people respect your life and your property. Mm. And to me, that's kind of interesting because it suggests that, that we libertarians have, um, this will make your, your, your you freak out a little bit, but we, we kind of have a social responsibility. We're social animals and uh, very few of us live in a bunker in, in, the, in the middle of Idaho. So we, we're, we're sort of counting on everyone else to follow these same rules that, that that we have, but I, but I think a key part of the libertarian philosophy, you know, I, I, we got a, a St. Frederick Hayek right over here. Um, we, we should have a moment of silence for him. <laughs> but he, he talks about how it is that free people, and he's told this from the Scottish Enlightenment, you know, how it is that, that people just figure stuff out. 
because they're free. And I don't think we do spend enough time talking about that stuff because because we're always talking about um, liberty, leave me alone, taxation is theft. And I agree with all those things, but we need to explain to people this alternative world where free people figure stuff out and, and make the world a more beautiful place. What do you, how do you respond to that? Do you, do you agree or? I totally agree. I mean, if you, you talk about people working together in mutually beneficial ways, that is libertarianism. That is the market process. People engaging in trades with one another where they're increasing their standard of living by giving up something they value less or something they value more. People organizing on a voluntary basis, churches, uh, opera houses, museums, libraries, uh, fellowship organizations. I mean, th this was what characterized um, 19th century America. I mean, there were so many voluntary organizations that, I mean, I can imagine people were even complaining about too many voluntary organizations. But, but that is freedom. I, I think that the, there's a very small minority in a free society that are actually going out doing the murdering, raping, stealing, and so forth. And if the state's limited to, to doing only that, to targeting those people, then it does a much better job in, in getting rid of those people and putting them in the penitentiary and so forth so that the 98% of people can conduct themselves in a voluntary, mutually beneficial way. And I think your point about the system in which we, we all grow up in is such a, an important one because when you, when you grow up in a system, you, it's hard to break out of that box, especially when you're indoctrinated with the notion that it's freedom. And I think that's part of the problem. One of my favorite quotes is by Johann Goethe, that none are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. So we grow up in this giant welfare state, warfare state apparatus, and people think, well, this is freedom. And then libertarians come along and say, we want to dismantle it. It's like, oh my gosh, what are they saying? They want to get rid of freedom? But you, you take like domestic borders. We don't have any border restrictions crossing between the states. It's a normal way of life. Everybody's accustomed to it. But if we had grown up in an opposite system where each state could establish border controls, tariff restrictions, then that would have been the natural thing. And people would have, we, we libertarians would have come along and said, how about if we just have open borders domestically? People would be shocked. Oh my gosh, no. So I, I think that's a big hurdle that you, that you bring up that we face is how do you get people to break out of the box in which they, they're, they're stifled, where energy and creativity is stifled because of this omnipotent presence of the state? You know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm soft on open borders when it comes to California. I, I sort of feel like they should be walled off because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of Californians fleeing California and, and, and just the, the dumb level of, of Everything about California at a governance level is a, is a mess. But now they're screwing up Texas and they're, they're, they're migrating to other states and, <laughs> and, and dis disturbing that. So would you, would you agree that we should at least wall off California? Well, <laughs> maybe, but I mean, I remember, in, I'm a native Texan, I remember there were signs about when the, the savings and loan crisis when everybody from New York was moving to Texas and there were signs all over the state saying, we don't care how you did it in New York. Yeah. So yeah. th there are dangers involved with with open immigration, but I, on balance, I would say freedom is better. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that. I, I think that the, the the phrase "open borders" and you know this this, this triggers uh, certainly conservatives and and a lot of people in both the Republican and Democrat parties. Um, what does open borders mean to you? Explain to how that system would work in practice. All right, well, we just look at the domestic United States, uh, that people are free to cross between Maryland and Virginia every day. Countless people do it in both directions. Some of them can be terrorists, murderers, thieves, robbers, people coming to steal jobs from Virginians and so forth. But the borders are completely open. Nobody keeps track. Nobody knows what the numbers are. Uh, there's also uh, the, the possibility of a trade deficit between, say, Virginia and, and Florida, where Virginians are going down there and spending a lot of money in the wintertime, and they're going to Disney World, but Floridians are not buying the same amount of stuff from Virginians, and so there's this big trade deficit. Who cares? No, nobody pays attention. Apply that principle internationally. And 
again, the obstacle is that since we've grown up one where there's international border controls, it's like, oh, my gosh, the whole world would move here. Well, the whole world doesn't move to San Francisco, as you just pointed out, even though San Francisco is a very attractive place, or that is the whole nation doesn't move to San Francisco. People prefer Nashville or Birmingham or wherever they live. And the same thing applies people living in foreign countries. What we have here is a gigantic socialist immigration system because it's based on central planning, which is a core principle of, of socialism. The, the government plans how many immigrants from each country are going to be permitted to come in, what the numbers are going to be, what the qualifications, the credentials. So it's no surprise that you have this perpetual crisis. I mean, this is what Ludwig von Mises called planned chaos. That's what central planning produces. Well, to enforce this thing, because people ignore it, if you just put up a sign and said you can't come in without official permission, people are going to ignore it because people have always ignored signs like that to seek a better life, pursue happiness, get a job. So they need to enforce it. And that's where the police state comes into existence. And I, I've lived that police state firsthand. You've got highway checkpoints in the American Southwest that stop cars for, that have never entered Mexico. Roving Border Patrol checkpoints, I've been the victim of one of those where they just stop whatever car they want and say, open your trunk on the highway at random. Uh, they have warrantless trespasses on the farms and ranches. We experienced that on my farm in, in Laredo. Uh, boarding Greyhound buses, this Berlin Wall, the Berlin fence. Uh, I mean, it just goes on and on. Uh, and it's a police state. There's only one solution to this, to this crisis. I've seen this crisis all my life. And, and there's only one solution. That's freedom and free markets. Just dismantle the system and leave people free to cross borders the same way that people cross borders from Maryland into Virginia. They can retain their citizenship. Citizenship. They don't have to change to an American citizen unless they want to. People free to cross back and forth, goods, services. Within a week, nobody would even know who was a citizen and who wasn't a citizen. Nobody would care any more than anybody cares whether somebody's a, a citizen today when you interact with people. You know, how often do you go and ask somebody, are you an American citizen when you, they have an accent when you're talking to them? Nobody cares. You're dealing with human beings at this point. So I say that not only is open borders moral, it's the only practical solution. And I underline un only. There is no other solution to the immigration crisis except free, freedom and free markets. The one thing you said that is important to reiterate is is how many American citizens are swept up in this this very authoritarian. You know, we're, we can stop you wherever. We can search your car without a warrant. We can um, uh, that the I think it's the TSA is now seizing people's phones on airplanes ostensibly to to fight terrorism. But let, let me throw a couple uh, criticisms of open borders at you and, and see what, a, what a, a libertarian would say. One of, the, one of the arguments against open borders is that people just want to come here and, and plug into the welfare system. Is that true? And what do you do about it? I have never met any immigrant at all that says he came over here to get on welfare. I mean, my experience has always been that immigrants come here to get rich. They want to make money. And nobody gets rich on welfare. Uh, and there, I have also never heard of an immigration raid on a welfare office. They are always on private businesses because that's where immigrants are, illegal immigrants. Uh, they're working for a living. They're trying to make money. And so it, it's, it's a canard, this idea that, that people come here to get on welfare. But even if that were true, let's just say a minority um, wanted to do that. Well, it's easy to put restrictions on. Uh, all Congress has to do is say nobody that comes in here is entitled to get on welfare. Uh, that's an easy fix. Um, now, is there still a risk that they might go into hospitals, uh, public hospitals or something? Well, yeah. Well, of course, I would say privatize the hospitals and that risk di uh, dissipates. But even if it does result in higher taxes, and that's really the argument that people are making, they go on welfare, which means then that our taxes are going to go up to have to pay for this. I would say that that's a small price to pay as compared to the abandonment of our principles. If we permit liberals and conservatives to manipulate us into joining with them on any status uh, position, they've won. We've become one of them. And I would say that's the worst thing libertarians could do. 
that we have to continue adhering to our principle, even if the price is in the form of higher taxes. I mean, people have paid a lot higher prices for freedom than that. And then an analogy is the drug war. We stand for the legalization of drugs, libertarians do. If you legalize drugs, some drug users would undoubtedly get treatment by going on Medicaid, which is the same principle. Therefore, should we libertarians join up and with the, the Republicans and Democrats and support the drug war until Medicaid is abolished? I don't think so. We've got to adhere to our principles, even when they pinch a little bit, and then continue arguing on why welfare or mandatory charity is wrong and should be abolished, not just for immigrants, but for everyone. So we've talked about, about ending the drug war on this show. Um, uh, Dr. Jeff Singer, uh, who's a Cato scholar, has done some really good work on this. And there's, there's actual empirical evidence that ending the drug war um, helps solve the most pernicious problems created by the drug war when it comes to human health and overdoses and, 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 and customers forced off of legal opioids for whatever reason because the government has decided to, to limit those, to ration those, to, to make it a crime. Um, and then they end up with fentanyl and they die. So there's, in, in Portugal, there's, there's, there's been an experiment. They used to be the worst in the, in the European Union in terms of, of drug overdoses, deaths, all of the, the, the squalor associated with um, uh, drug addiction. And they just legalized everything. Or I, I, they didn't legalize everything. They decriminalized everything and made it safe for people with problems to sort of come out of the woodwork and, and say, I need help. And all of their, all of their bad numbers went down. And all of their good numbers went up. Fewer young people um, were were doing drugs. Uh, fewer people were dying of of overdoses from substances they didn't really know what it was. And they went from the worst in the European Union to the best. So we actually know in practice what happens if you let people free. They don't all become junkies. They it's it's quite the opposite. Absolutely, and and as you suggest, it's the only humane solution to this whole thing. I mean, um, when people say, when the, the news media reports that people are dying of overdoses, oftentimes what they mean is corrupted drugs. And those corrupted drugs are because people have had to buy those drugs on the black market. Yeah. If in, in a legal market, they would be getting those drugs from pharmaceuticals, drug uh, companies, um, you know, reputable businesses that have an interest in providing a sound, healthy product. Now, none of us is saying that drug addiction is a good thing, that opioid addiction is a good thing. We're just saying it doesn't belong in the criminal justice sector. It belongs in the private rehab center where people can be open about their addictions without worrying about a narc busting them and sending them away to the penitentiary. And if you look at all these drug cartels and, and drug gangs and turf battles, I mean, they've destroyed Mexico. Um, you know, when, when I was a kid, we could go into Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and have a great time over a weekend, and nobody would dare to do that now. Because of the drug war, it's killed tens of thousands of people, and it's like prohibition. And so it's ironic that the federal government spends so much time prosecuting all these drug lords and extraditing them and stuff, when all they do is just get replaced by a new gang. When there's a simple solution, if you legalize drugs, those drug cartels and drug gangs go out of business immediately. That's the way to put them out of business. Just legalize drugs because they can't compete in a legitimate market. Overnight. They Overnight. Just, their, just like their, when, their market disappears. Absolutely. Just like when prohibition ended, all the Al Capone gangs went out of business overnight. So it's, the, it's really the only solution to this thing is to end drug prohibition just like we, we ended alcohol prohibition. And by, by the way, if you're, if, if you're worried about the southern border and, and the large caravans of people that are coming up from Central America, um, that is almost exclusively the result of the drug war. Um, a, a friend of mine who runs the libertarian think tank in Honduras, she would tell us that it is the, the drug gangs that were created by the American war on drugs that have destroyed the rule of law in her country. So um, people, think about picking up your family from your home where you grew up and your parents grew up and marching from Honduras through Mexico and all the dangers associated with that to, to come to the southern border. That's not a rational thing to do unless you don't have a choice. 
So one one of the things that we could do on a very practical level, if you're if you're worried about um, people from from Latin America coming here Ill- illegally, is stop the drug war that's that's creating so much chaos in their in their hometowns. That is a fantastic point, because you, you, the drug war clearly has is one of the major reasons for the aberrance in migration flows. Uh, that things would be much more normal if you didn't have that violence that was causing people to flee. And then there's also the military interventionism that, that the U.S. has engaged in in Latin America with coups and, and uh, that type of thing that has created massive violence that also causes people to flee those lands and try to save their families. We see it in, in the Middle East and Afghanistan with where military interventionism in those countries has created so much chaos and crisis and death and suffering that you end up with this this aberrant migration flow into Europe. And then people say, oh, see what, what open borders do? Well, that has nothing to do with the normal migration flow of open borders. This has to do with the U.S. government causing the conditions that cause this tremendous aberrance in migration flows. Well, let's talk about foreign policy. And I, I, I think you've mentioned it already, but I know that that's a, that's a core platform for you. And I think a probably a core platform of libertarianism is that we we spend way too much of our treasure and the lives of, of our young men and women in these these foreign con- conflicts that are that are really another form of of central planning if you will like that when when we go into Libya and do regime change the aspiration is to create an American style democracy somehow magically we're going to plan that from the top down and uh, all of a sudden um, you're not going to be dealing with with gang leaders and and factionalism based on tribe and religion but of course we made things worse a lot worse in Libya but you could fill in the blank with Afghanistan Iraq even what's going on in uh, in Syria today so what is the what is the the, the, the libertarian solution to uh, nation building? End it and don't engage in it. Uh, just end all foreign interventionism. I favor bringing all the troops home from everywhere, not just the Middle East and Afghanistan, uh, Korea, Africa, Latin America, Europe. World War II is over. Bring them all home and discharge them. I, b- I bet you people have no idea how many places in the world. I've seen these maps, and I don't remember the numbers right now, but but we have troops in the furthest reaches of the globe in places that we don't even know exist generally. Oh, it's incredible. I mean, it can be called an empire of military bases, uh, not to mention the CIA, all their secret outposts and so forth. But, Matt, there, there's no nation state that is invading the United States. No nation state has the remotest capability or even interest in invading the United States. They're broker than the U.S. government is. And so all of this stuff that's taking place over there, the death, the suffering, the destruction under Operation Enduring Freedom or Operation Iraqi Freedom, and, you know, this, this concept that you're talking about of central planning where you're, you're trying to, to produce freedom in countries by killing masses of people. Uh, that are certainly not going to experience this free society that they're trying to establish. It's just a moral abomination. Assassinations, coups, alliances with dictatorial regimes. This is not what America was founded on. This is not what America was, was supposed to be built on. So when Donald Trump says he wants to make America great again, what he doesn't understand is that you cannot have a great nation whose government is engaged in all this foreign interventionism. It's got to stop. Our founding principle was non-interventionism. Now, they call that, our, our opponents call this isolationism, which is ridiculous because we, I favor opening the borders to the free movements of goods and people and services where the American people, the private sector, is unleashed or are unleashed to interact with the people of the world. They want to do it different. They want to unleash the federal government to continue stomping on people around the world and isolate the private sector with Berlin walls and tariffs and import restrictions and immigration controls. We want to do the opposite. We want to bring in the, the rein in the federal government to a limited government republic, unleash the private sector to interact with the people of the world. Foreigners love Americans. They love our, our 
tourism. They love our culture. They love our values. They love our principles and the Declaration of Independence. They love our Statue of Liberty. They love our business groups. They love our money. They just don't like the federal government and with some justification. Yeah. I'm thinking of the protesters in Hong Kong. And one of the one of the positive memes on the internet is, is uh, be to Americans, be the Hong Kong that people in Hong Kong, be, be the Americans that Hong Kong thinks you are. I just butchered that, but I, I eventually <laughs> got to it. But because, yeah, there's those 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 values that I think I, th- I think most people in the world and certainly people that that come here uh, wanting to create a better life for their family, they're they're coming here for those. The, I would call them core American values, but I, they're human values, um, freedom, the ability to work. Uh, the ability, the ability to to choose your own way in life, and to to pursue happiness as you f- see fit, um, those are kind of things that that your mom taught you. Absolutely, and I, I was I was traveling in Cuba several years ago, and a guy comes up to me and he he takes me around the corner where nobody can hear, and he and he speaks English in broken English, and he says to me. Mr. I know you're from America, and I, I just want you to know my dream, my, my, my life dream, he was about 21 years old, yeah. is to go to New York City and see the Statue of Liberty. And what was fascinating, he bore no resentment, and no Cuban bears any resentment to any American that travels in that country because they separate out the, the American people with the, from the federal government. Now, a lot of terrorists don't do that. They conflate the two, and a lot of Americans conflate the two. But... When I learned from that, what I learned from that exchange is that people really do admire what we stand for, our principles and so forth, but they don't like the embargoes and the sanctions and the invasions and the coups and so forth. Let's go back to healthcare because I think your your platform and I've I've heard I was I was I listened to your Tom Woods podcast and your Scott Horton podcast, and I want to I want to get into the run for president, but. Your, your platform on healthcare is to abolish Medicare and Medicaid. And, and I'm gonna push back a little bit. Um, is, is that enough? Because the, the biggest problem I think in healthcare is not uh, Medicare and Medicaid, but the fact that the government has created these perverse incentives to kind of outsource insurance and care and the decision about whether or not you go to the doctor to a third party. And that, that might be your, your corporation, it might be in your insurance company. With Medicare and Medicaid, it's, it's a government agency deciding whether or not you get this treatment or you qualify for this treatment. So don't we have to go, um, go a little bit further and, and get the government out of the healthcare markets first before we just repeal Medicare and Medicaid, because I think about people on those programs, they, they're going to be like, well, what am I going to do? They're going to have sort of a visceral reaction against your proposal. Well, absolutely. I mean, once, once the government creates a program where people are essentially on the dole, then life becomes unimaginable without the dole. I mean, yeah. it's like a political narcotic. You know, you take a heroin away from an addict and he thinks I'm going to die. But it, it actually would be the best thing that could ever happen. It's the only solution. But I agree with you. I mean, I always say repeal Medicare and Medicaid, and to a larger extent, end all government involvement in health care entirely. In, in other words, separate health care in the state. Eliminate occupational licensure. Milton Friedman made that point in Capitalism and Freedom, where he's got that, that essay where he—, he, he calls for the repeal of occupational licensure and uses the medical profession as the example as compared to hairdressers and so forth. But look, we had the finest healthcare system in history. When I was a kid in the 50s, nobody even had major medical insurance. There was a few people that had catastrophic health care, but nobody had major medical. And there was a reason for that. Healthcare costs were low. They were stable. It was like going to the grocery store. You know, how many people have health, uh, grocery store insurance to protect against the soaring cost of groceries? Nobody. Well, that's the way it was. Um, I told you that I grew up in Laredo. The Census Bureau said that we were the poorest city in the United States. Every day, doctor's offices in Laredo were filled with people, most of whom could not pay the bill. Many of them had, come, had c- crossed over from Nuevo Laredo to get medical care. They couldn't pay. Sometimes they'd bring over some tamales or something to give to the doctor. No one ever got turned away, as far as I know, by any doctor. 
they provided free health care to these people because they felt it was their ethical duty to do that. Uh, innovations were skyrocketing. Doctors love what they did in life. My doctor would make house calls, or, or we would go to his house to get a tetanus shot if we got you know, hit with something. Uh, he'd say, yeah, come on by. And, and right there at his house, he'd give us a tetanus shot. Medicare and Medicaid come into existence, and that was the beginning of the end of this finest health care system in history. That's the cause of the soaring health care costs. So when you've got this cancer, You've got to get rid of the cancer. You can't reform it. And, and my point is that anybody who thinks they're going to come up with a health care reform plan that leaves a Medicare and Medicaid intact, they're living in la-la land. Impossible. Is it, so that's a necessary prerequisite to restoring a healthy health care system. Prices would immediately plummet. Uh, they become more stable. Is that sufficient? Of course not. I totally agree with you. You've got this distortion in the income tax where you, you encourage employers to buy people's insurance. Well, over time, I don't think people are going to need insurance anymore. But that's a distortion. You've got health care regulations, insurance regulations, occupational licensure. I would say separate health care and state entirely. That's the ultimate goal, just as our, as our ancestors separated church and state. So that just as we don't have government involved in, in religious activity, we, we need to get government out of the healthcare business. You know, if you look at the, if, at the data, um, to your point about the, the, the more that the government subsidizes things that, that people think are very important, access to healthcare is very important, access to education is very important, the government has aggressively subsidized and intervened and monkeyed with those markets. And if you look at um, sectors of the economy where inflation runs rampant, healthcare is number one, education is number two. Um, so that like the more we, the more we take from other people to spend on these programs, the more expensive it gets, ironically crowding out people that can least afford access to healthcare. Right, and these are classic socialist programs. I mean, this is what, what people often forget. I mean, Cuba provides free government-provided health care to the citizenry. So does North Korea. And, and same with education. Public schooling is a classic socialist program. And so is it any, any surprise to a libertarian that you've got this perpetual educational crisis or perpetual health care crisis? Well, of course not. I mean, this, this is what socialism does. It produces... Planned chaos or crises, perpetual crises. We would separate education in the state, we libertarians, just as we separate church and state and health care in the state. The, the state has no legitimate role in education any more than it does in religion or, or health care. It's the only solution here is freedom and free markets. So let's, let's switch to politics. You are taking the exact opposite tact that I have in my career. I, I was very involved in politics not that long ago, and I, I thought that, that politics was, was a practical way to try to shift um, governance in, in a more limited government and more libertarian way. Uh, we don't need to get into whether or not that was a good idea or was it successful, but I've, I've gone from politics, which in a lot of ways I find to be um, off-putting to people. Like once, once you join a team, then, um, the other teams, it could be Republican, it could be Democrat, um, maybe less so for libertarians in large part because I think a lot of people don't even know who we are yet. Um, but I've gone from politics to education <laughs> and wanting to, to get above politics and talk about common values and, and the stories that unite us. And you're doing the opposite because you just spent 30 years on education, communicating about values, and you've decided to become a politician. Why did you do that? Okay. I, I've been doing this in the educational arena for 30 years, and I, I, I've gotten to the point in my life where I really want to live in a free society. I, I don't want to make this an esoteric e enterprise. And, and there's been a lot of libertarians that have passed on, Mises and Hayek and Friedman and Frank Shutteroff, Leonard Reed, uh, on and on, that have passed on without seeing a free society that they work so hard for. Well, that may happen to you and me. Uh, I'm, I'm at that age where that's a distinct possibility. Uh, but I figured, okay, let's just give it one good college try here and take these people on more directly as compared to the educational arena, which is sort of an indirect way to influence people. 
let's take them on directly by seeking the Libertarian Party presidential nomination. Because I think people in America are getting a sense that there's something fundamentally wrong in this country. I mean, okay, so you've got a stock market that's soaring and you've got an unemployment rate that's low, but people are still sensing something is fundamentally wrong. You got soaring suicide rates among young people. I mean, what's that all about? You know, you can understand an older person checking out after he's been beaten down by life. But a young person who's 19, 20, 21 years old, I mean, this is the start of a great adventure from birth to death, and increasing numbers are checking out. To me, that's a conclusive sign that something's dreadfully wrong in this society. Massive drug addiction, alcoholism, unexplained acts of mass violence, all these are signals saying, red alert, red alert, there's something going on that's really bad in this society, and people are sensing that. So I said, okay, why don't I jump into this race and try to get the Libertarian presidential nomination to show people what it is that's wrong with this country. It's the, it's the destruction of freedom that I think is the root cause of much of the dysfunctionality in American society. And so you use the political process to do that, and I'm, and I'm doing that in my campaign. For example, I'm, I'm waging a very active campaign in North Carolina that is outside the Libertarian movement. We've earned the right to be in the presidential primary there, Super Tuesday. We've got 16 libertarians on the ballot. So when people go in there, they can request a, an, a libertarian ballot. The, at least the independent voters can. Well, so I saw this as a great opportunity. So I started going in there. I, my signature issue there is the racial bigotry of the drug war. I mean, I, I think the drug war is the most racially bigoted government program since segregation. It, this all this Jim Crow mass incarceration. So I've been meeting with African Americans down there. I've been going and introducing myself. I went door to door campaigning in the poorest African American neighborhood in Wilmington, passing out a a flyer called Free Michael Holmes. Holmes is a, a black man who who got a 200 year jail sentence in North Carolina, uh, 25 years ago for a nonviolent drug offense. He's like a poster child for the racial bigotry of this program. Well, I just got a newspaper article by a reporter for the Carolinian in Raleigh uh, that is a black newspaper, black reporter, saying that he's an ardent leftist. He's to the left of Barack Obama. He's considering voting for me for president on Super Tuesday, and he's exhorting his readers to do the same thing. I couldn't ever do that. With, with the educational arena. I mean, we've had, we've had programs at HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities and so forth, but this political campaign is enabling me to reach real Americans and campaign among real Americans with hardcore, pure libertarian ideas, and that's very exciting for me. So I listened to your podcast with Scott Horton, a fellow libertarian, and he compared you favorably to Ron Paul. Uh, those are pretty big cowboy boots to fill. Um, but you're from the same part of the country. Um, one of the things that I didn't appreciate when Ron Paul was running for president, and I'm not sure he did either, but he very capably used um, presidential politics as a soapbox to talk about ideas and values and, and created what I call the Ron Paul generation. If you're, if you're 30-something today, you were probably turned on to... to Austrian economics and, and basic libertarianism by Ron Paul. Um, which gets to the, the question, you're running for president, is your goal to win? Is your goal to change hearts and minds? Um, are you gonna take it all the way to the White House? What, what is your aspiration? Well, first of all, let me say that Ron Paul is, is one of my real life heroes. I mean, I campaigned for him in the 2008 race. I went to New Hampshire before the primary and I went door to door, which was not an easy thing because Winter and I don't get along very well at all. And it was cold <laughs> up there in New Hampshire. Uh, but Ron's heroic because he talks about liberty. I mean, you can't help but hear a talk by Ron and not have your heart start thumping a little bit more. And he's been such an inspiration for me. And I don't think there's been anyone that has brought more people into the libertarian movement than Ron Paul. I mean, people discovered libertarianism because of his campaign. He showed 
or campaigns, he showed what can be accomplished with a political campaign. And, and that, that when he took that hardcore stance in that presidential debate against foreign interventionism, and, and when he got into the argument with, with Giuliani on the stage there, and I thought to my, I was watching this and I thought to myself, Ron, you are truly courageous and heroic, but you're dead meat now. <laughs> and that was when his campaign took off because right. people understood the power of truth. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what I hope to, to emulate there is, is that, that exposition of truth and principles that Ron does. The other thing is the, in the Fed, I mean, like, when did you ever think, I mean, who would ever, what political consultant would say, you know, we're going to use it in the Fed as a political position here. And yet it took off like wildfire. Uh, so, yeah, Ron, Ron's heroic. He did the introduction to my new book called My Passion for Liberty that's available on Amazon. It's an autobiographical account of my life and the principles of libertarianism, and it was a big honor when he did that that uh, introduction. Yeah, he wrote a, a glowing introduction. He really did. I mean, uh, I don't was, know how much that cost, but it was— <laughs> It was worth every no, penny. No, no, it was, it was free. He, <laughs> he did it voluntarily, and uh, it's just tremendous honor. Um, look, when you, when you enter a race like this, you, there, there's no delusions of grandeur. We, we know where libertarians get, you know, 1.5%, 3%, or whatever. But, but the way I figured it is you got to fight to win. Uh, e- even though you don't have a chance to win, you've got to fight like you can win. And that's what I intend to do if I'm the nominee is I'm going to take these people on. On, these, on what they've done to this country. They have destroyed our freedom in this country, Matt. They've destroyed our well-being. With, and it's not a, you know, like the Democrats try to pose it in the mainstream press, that Donald Trump's a bad person. He's a rotten person. Oh, he's a liar and all this nonsense. That has nothing to do with this. We're looking at a systemic problem, not a person problem. We need to replace the systems by legalizing drugs and and getting rid of the national security establishment, foreign interventionism, mandatory charity. When we get rid of these bad systems, now we're talking about a free, peaceful, prosperous, and harmonious society. That's what I want to bring into this race. I want to raise people's vision to what freedom really is. It's those two questions. What is freedom? I want to raise people's vision to what freedom really is the fact that they've lost freedom, and what should be the role of government in a free society. At that point, whatever the votes come out, well, the votes come out, and we don't have any control over that. We only have control over what we share with people, and that's why I keep telling libertarians, we're the party of principle. We have to adhere to principle. We're not Republican lights. We're not Democrat lights. We're not socially liberal and economically conservative. We are libertarians, and that's our weapon. You know, the other parties have money, but they don't have something we have. We have principles, we have ideals, and we have sound ideas on liberty, and that's what we need to fight with. So, uh, obviously, Ron Paul was uh, running as a Republican, and and one of the big problems for, for libertarian candidates for president is access to the presidential debate stage. And you, you probably know the data, but the Republican and Democrat cartels keep raising the bar to qualify to be on the stage by by the standards held uh, to Ross Perot in, was that 1990? I think that yeah. was. Mm-hmm. Um, Gary Johnson absolutely should have been on the stage in the last presidential cycle, but they keep changing the rules. So um, can, a, can a libertarian candidate get on that stage because one of the reasons that Ron Paul took off was that he had access to the stage. That's right. And it's a protection racket. I mean, that's all it is. The way I look at it is you don't really have two major political parties. You have one party, the welfare warfare party that is divided into two wings, sort of like the football national football league is divided into two conferences or divisions. Uh, It's one party divided into two wings and they're fighting over control. That's all they're fighting over, the control over the money and the power. And, but they're threatened by third parties and independents. And so they look, up, they, they look for every way to protect themselves from that competition. Uh, ballot access laws, uh, campaign finance limits. I mean, look what Eugene McCarthy did in that New Hampshire primary against Lyndon Johnson. I mean, that really was the catalyst that would ultimately cause Johnson to drop out of the race and Bobby Kennedy get, to get into the race. But, but McCarthy was funded by about four or five people that were free to give as much money as they wanted to his campaign. They saw that, the Democrats and Republicans. That's what campaign finance limits are all about. So when they limit us to $2,800 a person, they know we don't have a big base of support. 
And But we have wealthy people in this movement that could fund us to the tune of a million dollars with one donation, and they won't permit that to happen. They've got these petitioning requirements. They've got these debate requirements where they say 15 percent in the polls and 20 percent of the polls. And if we ever get close to that, you know they're going to raise it again. Uh, all right, so what we just have to keep educating people on is that that is part of this protection racket and that if people want us to be on that stage, then they need to start responding in these, in these polls that we want liber- we're going to vote libertarian in some, and we're going to vote libertarian in order to get libertarians more prominently featured and preferably in these presidential debates. I mean, in a sense, we have to earn our way into that, but that depends on the American electorate. If, if they like what we stand for and they want us in there challenging this one-party system divided into two wings, then they've got to start responding in a way that causes us to increase in the polls. So you were a, you were a member of the Libertarian Party, and and I think on the platform committee, um, in the was it the nineteen nineties? Um, yeah. And and you, I think you left the Libertarian Party to focus on education, um, but it it seems like from day one that the the internal argument within the LP. Is is you know what's what's our goal here? What's our mission? Are we about educating the public, and are we using politics as a platform to educate people, or are we trying to win elections? Um, practically speaking, should we put up a former governor as a credible candidate who could actually um, be president and and has traditional qualifications? I'm guessing you fall in the opposite camp, which is we have to talk about values and principles and 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 let the chips fall where they may. But what's your opinion about what, what is the purpose of the Libertarian Party? The goal of the Libertarian Party from the very first day it was conceived in the living room of David Nolan in Colorado in 71 is the achievement of a free society. That's its goal. Getting people into public office is the means to that goal. It is not the goal itself. Now, I hold that it is entirely possible for a libertarian to advocate libertarian principles and be elected to public office. And, and, but that, of course, depends on the electorate. If the electorate looks at libertarian principles and, and decide, well, we've studied your philosophy, we don't like it, we reject it, so be it. I mean, it's just nobody is guaranteed success in life. So if a libertarian runs on libertarian principles and he loses, well, that's just the way life turns out. But if you want to achieve a free society, the only chance you have is to convince people to raise their vision to a higher level, to the real principles of freedom. And that means standing on freedom principles. For example, why should anybody think about the legalization of all drugs if libertarians won't talk about the legalization of all drugs? Why should people think about a free society in terms of health care or retirement, like getting rid of these socialist programs, if libertarians aren't going to make the case for that free society? And if libertarians aren't going to make the case, how are we going to achieve freedom? So what I see is the opportunity for libertarian candidates to go out and make the case. Now, that that's a hard row. I mean, it's not easy to go out there and argue for why Social Security should be abolished or Medicare should be abolished. But I think there's people out there that would respond favorably, specifically the young people in this country, not seniors. They're on the dole. They're not going to vote for a libertarian. But the young people who are having a hard time starting out in life and who are being insulted, I mean, they're the ones that are saying you can't be trusted with freedom because you won't take care of your parents. They're a natural voter for us. African Americans who have suffered from this, this, this bigoted drug war, they're natural voters for us, immigrants uh, or families of immigrants. So I say stick with the principles and let the chips fall where they may because it's the only chance we have to get into office. If, if, you, if Leonard Reed used to say, you're never going to fly higher in office than you flew getting there. So if you fly into office on republican light principles or democrat light principles, what have you accomplished? You can't get into office and then say, hey, I faked you all out. I want to abolish these programs because people are going to consider you a fraud. So you got to be true to yourself, be true to your own principles, and stand w- in that way, true to yourself. A good example of this is Frederick Bastiat. I mean, we know that Bastiat's been a tremendous influence on practically every libertarian. Well, he got elected to the le- legislature. On, on fundamental, sound, libertarian principles. He succeeded, but did he change France 
overall? No, he's a total failure in terms of turning France around. He's compared to like Cobden and Bright in England that really achieved success. Bastiat spinning in his grave as we speak, <laughs> looking at his home country. Oh. Um, so let, let's talk pra- practical stuff. You said, I think you said 15 candidates in North Carolina alone. How many? Uh, yes, yeah, approximately. There's 16 candidates running for president on, uh, in the LP right now. I think there might be more. Uh, but there's 16 on the ballot in North Carolina. Yeah. One of the things I like, and, and this is a criticism of the Libertarian Party, but one of the things I like about it is, is it, that it is truly democratic in the sense that um, all candidates are welcome and there's not uh, the kind of shenanigans that both the Republican and the Democratic parties do to their sort of outsider candidates where they, they, they sort of rig the system against them. But, you know, for outsiders that are used to two-party politics, they look at the LP and it looks a little bit chaotic. And people are like, really? 15 candidates? Although I guess the Democrats were there as well this year. Um, what, uh, and I don't know all of these candidates, but uh, you're, you're, you're new returning to the Libertarian Party. Uh, some people are sort of waiting for Justin Amash to jump into the race. What do you, what do you, what do you think about that? Obviously... He's not as good of a candidate as you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't be running. But uh, what do you what do you think? Of, and this gets back to this argument about do you do you do you go with a candidate who's won elected office and and has as credibility like that, or is that a bad idea for the LP? I think that the party just has to do a lot of soul searching and see what they want to do this time around. They they um, elected or nominated Bob Barr, who is a a congressman or former congressman or on the Republican ticket. They nominated um, Gary Johnson, former Republican governor. They, he got Bill Well, the former Republican governor. Uh, so I, I think the, the party is really faced with a choice at this point is do you want to keep going down that road or do you want to go back to the original idea of the Libertarian Party, people like Harry Brown that presented this principled, pure case for liberty. And of course, you know where I stand on this thing. Now, one of the advantages is that that when these big wigs come over to our party, they bring a lot of publicity. I mean, and it, when we talk about these 16 candidates, we don't generate the big publicity, nationwide publicity, because the mainstream press is basically as statist as the Democrats and Republicans are. So they look at us as sort of a marginal party instead of the third largest political party in the country. So that they don't they don't shine much light on, of publicity on us. But when one of these big wigs abandons these these status parties and comes over to the Libertarian Party, we get a lot of mainstream press on it. So that's one of the advantages of them coming into the race. And I agree with you. I, I think the Libertarian Party has this openness of, say, you want to run, fine. But I, I think the party has to decide, do you want to run a candidate that's going to be operating on the basis of Republican-like principles, reform principles, that is really not going to raise people's vision to the whole paradigm of libertarianism? Or do you want a presidential spokesman out there saying to Americans, this is what we need to do to get out of this morass that we have in this country, uh, that this is what the direction we need to go in terms of liberty, peace, prosperity, and harmony. And that's what I would l- hope to bring if I were recorded the, the nomination. Okay, so tell us, let's wrap up here. Tell us uh, if people are interested in your campaign, where they go, if they want to learn more about Future Freedom Foundation. Give us some some websites and ad- addresses here. Okay, we've got uh, the Future of Freedom Foundation, which, again, is not endorsing my candidacy. They're a 501c3. Uh, you can get 30 years of articles, and I, I continue to write there on non Politic, well, not non-political. I, I don't ever talk about Democrats or Republicans now. I've, we've imposed some real strict controls at FFF. We have a total separation of the foundation and my political campaign. So, you know, I don't even respond to people that ask me about my campaign and FFF emails and so forth. I just say, I'm sorry, I can't address that. But, they, but people can get a sense of the work I've done for liberty over the last 30 years by going to FFF.org. And there's videos and articles and presentations and all sorts of things and, and high-quality stuff that, that is by, by other people. I mean, we've had conferences with, with Ron Paul and Andrew Napolitano and Andrew Basevich and people from the left and the right that present 
been a solid case on, on civil liberties, foreign policy, the drug war. Glenn Greenwald we've had featured in our programs. Um, okay, so then on my campaign, that's jacobforliberty.com. And I write articles there, too. I have a very active blog that keeps people apprised of what I'm doing. Uh, people can donate there. I, I, I can really use some money there. I'm, going, I'm traveling every weekend from now until the May convention to state conventions. And, and it's exciting. I mean, I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. But I need help paying for the, the flights and the hotels and so forth to get those. And if people want to volunteer, they can volunteer on the site too. And I've got a great campaign manager named Jake Porter from the Iowa Libertarian Party, and he is coordinating all the, all the volunteers. So if you really want to volunteer and you want to do something, Jake will put you to work. And so uh, we got a nice operation. I got a great social media team, three of the best guys on social media around. So I started from scratch, Matt, but I'm slowly building a really nice organization of people that are really committed to this pure vision of liberty, of how we can get this country back on the right road, and that's at jacobforliberty.com. In the march to uh, the Libertarian Convention in Austin, would you, do you remember when that is? It's coming up soon, I think. Yeah, latter part of May, I think May 23rd, yeah. that weekend. And the delegates to the convention ultimately decide who the, their candidate will be. That's right. Each state convention nominates delegates or elects delegates to go to the national convention. And so that's why we go to these state conventions to give our pitch to the delegates there. But nobody's bound. Nobody's committed. Even in this North Carolina primary where I'll be uh, where I'm campaigning, whoever wins that primary and I'm doing my best to win that primary, the, the delegates are not committed. It's not a binding primary. Then all those delegates get together in Austin, the national convention, they decide who the nominee is going to be. Okay. Well, good luck to you, and thanks for taking the time with us. Matt, I can't thank you enough. I've just absolutely thoroughly enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.